Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode number 49 of the Zoomer Sports Radio. And as always, I'm your host, Andrew Moody. And today, I'm joined by an absolute legend in the college basketball world. A member of the 1989 Flying Illini team, a former NBA player, host of Bardo's Breakdown podcast, and an NBA and college basketball analyst for Big Ten Network and Fox Sports. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Stephen Bardo. Thanks a lot, Andrew. How you doing, man? Doing pretty good. Uh, glad to finally get you on the show. We've been talking for over a year now uh, to get it done, but I'm glad it's finally happening. Yeah, I am as well, and I, I appreciate your patience, my man. Well, yeah. So on today we're gonna we're gonna break down the preseason college basketball of the Big Ten. Maybe dabble in some other topics about uh, Bardo's career on and off the court. And so uh, I'm excited for this episode. Uh, uh, are you how how much are you excited for the basketball season while we're like two weeks away now from tip off to start the season i'm very excited yeah it's always a new beginning for teams and a lot of um you know excitement and people looking forward to what their teams uh this season's version of their particular squads will look like so i'm i'm excited a lot of storylines as always andrew oh for sure and uh i what i want we're gonna start with the big 10 and what we're gonna do is um go through Sports Illustrated's rankings, uh, the preseason power rankings, and have you give your breakdown breakdown on, well, how you feel the team will do, where, where they go, where your projections are, how you feel about this 22-23 uh, squad for every school. And uh, starting off at number one on the Sports Illustrated Big Ten rankings is uh, your alma mater, uh, my school that I grew up uh, rooting for, uh, See, I got the I got the Illinois jersey on, on the wall over there, Coleman <laughs> Hawkins. E- even though I'm an ACC guy now, the Big Ten's in my blood, Bl- Big Ten's in my roots. And Brad Underwood actually said this is the most talented roster he's ever had, this Illini team, which is pretty surprising with having All-Americans Kofi Coburn and Io Desumu, uh on this team before. So, Bardo, what's, what's your breakdown on this current Illini team? Tremendous amount of length uh, on the wings. Um They'll be able to play a lot of positionless basketball, meaning that there'll be guys that will have multiple uh, options. For example, Coleman Hawkins is the best example of this because at 6'10", he's going to play anywhere between the one and the five. He's going to run the point sometimes at 6'10". And uh, so Dane Danger up front can put it on the deck. Matthew Mayer, the transfer from Baylor, is 6'10", 6'9". He wants to be the defensive player of the year. In the Big Ten, Terrence Shannon, 6'7", wing from Texas Tech. You got uh, Luke Goody, who, who just announced he had foot surgery. He's having foot surgery, so he'll be out a while. But the Illini are so deep. Ty Rogers, uh, Terrence Shannon, Sky Clark, Jaden Epps. I mean, they are loaded with length and uh, depth on the perimeter. So it, it'll be exciting to see what this Illini team turns into. So even though they're losing their top five scores from last year in Kofi, Jacob, Jacob Grandison, Curbelo, Alfonso Plummer, and uh, I mean, uh, Trent Frazier, uh, mm-hmm. you, you still think they'll make bigger strides than they were in these past couple of years? Because with Kofi, they couldn't play this positionless, positionless basketball because they always needed him in the paint. Yeah, they can do a lot of different things. And I think this is the way that uh, Brad Underwood would prefer to play. Now, you can't turn down a seven-foot, 290-pound stud when you have a chance to get him. Uh, and so now that Kofi's gone, Brad Underwood can really do some creative things defensively, and this is the type of, of, of lineup that he wanted. So he's got to go back, Andrew, to his junior college coaching days in order to make a team gel very quickly. He's got 10 new players, and if the key to me is that if the guys accept their roles on this team, the Illinois team could be probably the team that's best suited to have the deepest run in the NCAA tournament. Which is definitely something they need after two, I would say, especially in 12, was it 2021, a disappointing mm-hmm. finish losing to Loyola. And then obviously uh, Houston last year in the Sweet 16, there was the uh, controversial technical foul call on uh, RJ Melendez that mm-hmm. changed the uh, forecast of that game. So, Obviously, they are looking to make a deep run in the tournament, and I do have to shout out uh, one of my guys, Paxton Warden, who's on that team. He, uh, he's a walk uh, preferred walk on this year, uh, so he'll be. So I got I got to get shout out Paxton Warden. He's been he's been working pretty hard with these guys. 
Okay, sounds good. And then number two on the list is Indiana, who uh, Mike Woodson's entering a second season, and he completely turned the culture in that program when he uh, picked it up from Ar- Ar- Archie Miller. And he's got a really talented uh, uh, team. He's got Trace Jackson Davis returning, who had 18 points last year. Xavier Johnson, another double-digit guy. And then the second most talented uh, freshman recruiting class led by uh, Jalen Hood, Shafino. And they're looking to, once again, bring back the the Bobby Knight, just like uh, Indiana, like blue blood necessarily, basketball back to Indiana that they haven't seen in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. And they've got uh, probably the best returning group do the Indiana Hoosiers. When you look at Race Thompson, Trace Jackson Davis, Xavier Johnson, those big three were integral in getting the Hoosiers back into the NCAA tournament last season. I think Tamar Bates, who's a left-handed wing, really good size, a 6'5", lefty. I think he could be a potential breakout star this season. But Jalen Hood Shafino is the kid that I'm looking for because Trace Jackson Davis compared him to Io DeSumo. He's also been uh, compared to um, Jason Kidd, light, not quite Jason Kidd, but Jason Kidd, like. Uh, So the Indiana Hoosiers have a a stacked squad. They've got youth. They've got size. They've got depth. And a lot of people have them picked to win the Big Ten title this season. Yeah, they're obviously they're ranked 13th in the AP preseason po- uh, poll, which is the highest out of any Big Ten team. And then if you're getting compared to a, a Naismith player of the year, uh, like top five runner up in Iota Sumu, and then an NBA Hall of Famer, Jason Kidd. So J- Jalen Hood Shafino is going to have a, a lot of uh, pressure to live up to those expectations. But that just shows how talented and skilled this guy is coming in out of high school. No, I totally agree. And I think he's got the he's got the body where he's ready to come in and play uh, already. And so I, I think that the, I think their success will have a lot, will depend a lot on uh, Jalen Hood Shafino's development and his ability to coexist in the backcourt with Xavier Johnson. And then moving on to the number three team, and this is the final, I believe the final team ranked in the preseason AP poll, which is Michigan uh, led by Yuan Howard at coach and, they have perhaps the best player in the Big Ten returning for his junior year, Hunter Dickinson, who averaged 18 and eight last year uh, in a sophomore campaign. And then they have a great freshman class with Doug McDaniel and Jet Howard, Jace's younger brother, and Yuan's other son. And then they also have a great transfer who was actually originally going to transfer here at Clemson, which is a Princeton guard, Jalen Llewellyn. He's obviously at Michigan now. And this, they, these guys had the best success in the tournament these past couple of years out of all the Big Ten teams. Yeah, they have. Michigan's done a really good job. Jawan, I think, has really made his team uh, peak at the right time. So both uh, last, the last two seasons, the Wolverines have played the best basketball at the best time of the year, which is they haven't won the Big Ten Conference Tournament but they've utilized that experience to catapult themselves into the NCAA tournament and really do a good job of matching up against their opponents. And so, you know, I really like what Michigan brings in terms of Hunter Dickinson up front. You know, they lost uh, a lot of guys at Musa Keita uh, was a guy that they were expecting to come back, but he's in the NBA. Um, So when you look at Doug McDaniel coming in at the point guard, Jalen Llewellyn, uh, I think people need to realize, even though he went to Princeton, he was a top 100 player. So this guy is capable. He can score the basketball. He can be the lead guard or the scoring guard. And I think he brings a lot of versatility to that program. And also uh, Jet Howard is going to be called upon to do some uh, good things as well. A really nice six foot seven, six foot eight wing player that can go between the two and the three. And so Michigan is going to be interesting to see they can get some help up front, some uh, depth up front behind Dickinson in case he gets in foul trouble. But their perimeter is as good as anybody's, uh, any team in the Big Ten. Yeah, and then um, I mentioned, uh, you, or, uh, you mentioned this earlier on your uh, social media accounts that Yuan Howard and Greg Gard made up at Big Ten Media Days. Like, so is there no more uh, beef there, uh, quote unquote, with uh, the altercation that happened last year? 
No, uh, Andrew, you know, the Big Ten has an unwritten rule of decorum and they want to be considered the, the, a gentleman's league. And so it was a bad tarnish. It was a bad look for both programs, both coaches. And I, I really applauded what they did. They squashed it. They hugged it out. Uh, they squashed the beef. And now we can move on. And we don't have to talk about it anymore. So that's buried. And both, both programs can move forward. All right, that is definitely good to hear. And then the number four team on the Sports Illustrated Big Ten Power Rankings is Iowa, led by Fran McCaffrey. And obviously, these they're losing Keegan Murray, but Chris Murray, his younger brothers, definitely look up to take that role. He averaged 9.7 points last year, and he's got Tony Perkins and another coach's son, just like Michigan, and Patrick McCaffrey to go along with him. And Iowa could be a dangerous team. Uh, we us here at Clemson, we played them early at the Emerald Coast Classic in Destin, Florida. Mm-hmm. So we're we're gonna get a good uh matchup between uh two uh power five schools early in the season there. No, Iowa is interesting because they have a lot of guys who can score. And I'm I didn't see this uh sports illustrated power ranking for the Big Ten, but it, it tells me that people are paying attention because Iowa's scary. Now, Chris Murray may not be as talented as Keegan. Uh, he may not be a lottery pick in the NBA, but he's he's definitely a, a good scorer. He's a better shooter than Keegan was last season from the three. Uh, he'll let his game. Fran McCaffrey does a great job of expanding guys' game. Uh, Rabracha up front has gotten better. He's gotten more comfortable. Patrick McCaffrey at 6'8", 6'9", is a matchup nightmare, can score the rock. Tony Perkins can score the rock. Sanford can shoot it from the parking lot. I was going to be very, very scary. The thing that may hold the Hawkeyes back is their consistency on the defensive end. If they can somehow find some consistency on that end of the court, I would not be surprised to see Iowa in the upper echelon, uh, upper half, or even upper maybe top four or five of the Big Ten. I feel like defense is what ha- has held Iowa back in the past with guys like Luca Garza, Jordan Bohannon, uh, Joe Wieskamp, these talented scorers. And then they just have trouble uh, stopping the other team from getting the ball in the bucket. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. And, you know, Fran McCaffrey wants to play with a lot of tempo. So I was usually one of the higher scoring teams in the Big Ten Conference year in, year out. And next year, this season will be no different just because they have so many different ways that they can go. The McCaffrey brothers are back. I didn't mention uh, – mention, um, Aaron Euless at point guard. He's a guy that doesn't score a lot, but he can really push the ball. He's more defensive oriented. So Iowa really can address a lot of different ways to go at you. Josh Agundale, uh, I believe, is back the, the, about 6'11, 280, 290. So, you know, for the Zach Edies, for the, you know, uh, uh, Hunter Dickinsons, they've got a guy up front that can bang with them defensively. And then number five is the Chris Holtman-led Ohio State team, which is losing a couple guys, E.J. Liddell, Michi Johnson. Liddell obviously went is in the G League now, and Michi Johnson transferred to South Carolina. But they still got a guy who I'm really high on, that's Justice Suing. Uh, which, are you a big fan of Justice Suing as well? I am, uh, Andrew. The problem with Justice is that he has not been, he's not been healthy. He's and had so, to deal with a hernia injury. Yeah, so he... That's the only thing that really scares me. I've got to see if Justice can stay healthy. Um, but if he can be healthy, he's a tough matchup. And he's a kind of guy, Chris Holtman loves undersized guys that can play multiple positions. Justice is that guy at six foot seven. He's a lefty, uh, can score, is strong, and loves to defend. And the thing with uh, the Buckeyes, they have so many new players. They've got Sam McNeil is a three-point specialist from West Virginia. They're looking at him. Uh, Isaac uh, Lekele, Le- 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 I think is. Yeah, I can't pronounce that either, but it's the Oklahoma State transfer. Yeah, Oklahoma State transfer. Again, six foot five, six foot six, can play multiple positions. So expect Ohio State's team to have this toughness about them. And they, Ohio State, will go as their freshman class goes. I mean, they've got an outstanding freshman class that's come in. And depending on how quickly they can develop, Ohio State can remain in the upper echelon of the Big Ten, or sometimes freshmen have a hard time adjusting. If they don't adjust very well, you can see the the Buckeyes maybe struggle over time. And then at number six in the power rankings, they had 
Purdue led by Matt Painter, who besides Tom Mizzo, I think it's the second longest tenured head coach in the big 10. That makes sense. If yeah. If I'm correct on that. And he's got, I, he's got two tremendous holes to fill and Jaden Ivy, who is a lottery pick for the Pistons now. And of course, Travion Williams, these two guys have been pillars in big 10 basketballs. Purdue was one of the best teams last year. And then they got can Zach Eady be filling that role as number one, but number one guy can Zach Eady do that. He averaged 14.4 points last year, 7.7 rebounds. Can Zach Eady take on uh, that role as like the team captain? So it's interesting, Andrew, when you look at Zach Eady's numbers from last season, you referenced his 14 points a game and almost eight rebounds. He did that in 20 minutes of play. He did that in half a game. So his numbers will increase this year. He probably will get, probably closer to 27, 28 minutes if his stamina can, can sustain itself. Uh, but he will be one of the premier players and bigs in the country, not just in the Big Ten. So here's the thing with Purdue. People forget about Mason Gillis. Tough, rugged, undersized four. Uh, that is really shooting the three well. Um, uh, Trace Kaufman was – Second runner-up, I think he was runner-up to Mr. Basketball. He redshirted last year. He's available at 6'8". He, is, he can really post up. One of the best post players in the Big Ten Conference. Uh, Caleb First, the outstanding uh, small, small forward slash power forward for Purdue. He's got another year under his belt. He seems, and he got some international playing experience this summer. He seems really, really poised to have a breakout season. And Braden Smith, is the freshman guard that I think is going to have quite a career at Purdue. I don't think he's a pro player necessarily, Andrew, but he's a guy with a lot of swagger. He's got really long arms at six foot one, can dunk on your head, surprising athlete, son of a coach. And I think that he could be, he could be one of the surprise players this year in the Big Ten. Uh, that is really good to hear for uh, Boilermaker fans out there. And then number seven, we have Michigan State. They, they lose Max Kersey to the NBA draft, but they still have two very skilled guards and Tyson Walker and Jaden Atkins. And we're not even talking about Malik Hall, who's probably their best player on that team. No, Michigan State is going to be interesting. Now, I think they could be the sleeper this season. Joey Hauser was the Big Ten Newcomer of the Year when he originally transferred from Marquette to Michigan State. The COVID experience, Tom Izzo told me, really hurt him emotionally, Joey Hauser. And he really hasn't found the consistency that they were expecting. He's had a tremendous all season. So even though Malik Hall is looked at as Michigan State's best player, Joey Hauser has the most upside. So if he can find a level of consistency, I think it could really catapult Michigan State to be one of the better teams as well. You talk about Atkins, Aikens, uh, uh, AJ Hogard is back. Walker is back in the backcourt. So they're really, uh, good there you talked about Malik Hall who is preseason uh first team all big 10 so if Maddie Sissoko up front can really be a defensive stalwart the Spartans could be a, a, a pesky dangerous team I always feel like when uh, Michigan State is like look looked lower on at the start of the season that's when they're most dangerous because <laughs> they had they have the probably a top five coach in big 10 history maybe even college basketball history Tom Mizzo but I feel like can always find a way to spark a run in the NCAA tournament. He's he's been shown to be able to do it. Oh, was it 20, 2014? He was a seven seed, made it to the final four. It was it was mm -hmm. the year uh Kentucky lost to Wisconsin and that ruined their undefeated season season. And they ended up losing to Duke in the final four to a Jaleel Okafor led Duke team. But I I mean Jackson Kohler is a an is a is a freshman coming in with a, a good amount of hype there. And mm -hmm. I, I, I really like this. I like what you said when this is your sleeper team, Michigan State. Yeah, I just think that a lot of people are overlooking them and they don't they don't appear to have a guy that jumps off the, the page as, as like an all Big Ten performer, but they've got a lot of guys who know their roles. They've got experience. They've got some toughness, which uh, Tom Izzo is going to demand. And listen, Michigan State starts the season with Gonzaga, Kentucky, Villanova, and I believe they played Duke in the uh, Big Ten ACC Challenge, if I'm not mistaken. They have a gauntlet of a schedule. So they may not look good early, Andrew, 
but they will be battle tested. They'll know exactly who they are entering the Big Ten slate this season. Yeah, that that's probably the best like non-conference schedule in the nation. I think so. Because they're so. playing against they're gonna play Gonzaga and San Diego on the on the aircraft carrier, I believe. Uh, yes. which will be probably one of the most watched college basketball games of the season. Definitely mm-hmm. gotta check that out. Is another one of my friends, Braden Huff for Gonzaga, will be playing in that game. So I'll definitely be tuned in there. And just I like I said, I'm I'm really up on this Michigan State team. And then number eight in the rankings, they had Rutgers, who Ron Harper Jr. is no longer there. He was kind of the guy there. So how will Rutgers be without having their guy who led them to the tournament the past two seasons? It's going to be interesting because Rutgers is a team that Steve Peichel's done a great job of instilling some toughness. And they play off that jersey energy in the rack, their home venue, which is one of the toughest to go get a victory in any place in the Big Ten. But when you talk about Rutgers, Cliff Omaru, his his name, his pronunci- I, pronunciation keeps changing. Go ahead. What are you going to say? I was going to say, I mean, you, I mean, I can't pronounce it, but you're going to have to get that down before you uh, start calling those Rutgers games this year. Well, the thing, here's <laughs> the thing. It, it was Omaruyi, and then he went to Morier last year. So I don't know. I'll say Morier, <laughs> which doesn't sound right, but. Cliff Amorier is, is a uh, preseason first team, uh, all Big Ten member. He dunks everything. Big, physical, athletic, uh, post player up front. So depending on his uh, development, will go a long way with Rutgers. Paul McKay, is a 6'7 point guard, really tough, uh, more defensive oriented. He's going to have to get his offensive game expanded. And then Caleb McConnell, who was last year's Big Ten defensive player of the year, He's a streaky shooter, streaky offensive guy. Those are the big th- three for Rutgers. They have to be outstanding in order for them uh, to, to have a chance to repeat at, a, uh, you know, because they were in the NCAA first four last year. And so these three guys are really going to have to elevate their offensive game in order for them to have a chance at an NCAA tournament bid. And then the number nine team, which – Personally, I don't know how they're ranked this low, and you you agree with me as you uh, post on your social media account, but I feel like history is going to repeat themselves here because the Wisconsin Badgers were ranked 10th last year on the preseason rankings, and they uh, gave Illinois a run for their money. I believe they tied them for the Big Ten regular season champ, but Illinois got it due to the head-to-head record, and they're once again slept on against, and they have two uh, all-Big Ten team preseasons, and Tyler Wall and Chucky Hepburn, and they're ranked ninth this year. So I feel like history is just doomed to repeat itself again. You know what, Andrew? I think the Big Ten likes Wisconsin. I think they like giving them bulletin board material uh, because it, there's one thing you can count on in the Big Ten is that Wisconsin is going to be in the upper echelon of the conference. It's very rare that they are not in the top four or top five of the Big Ten. I don't think this year is going to be any different because here's why. Chucky Hepburn is emerging as one of the best point guards in Big Ten. And he's he, as you referenced, he's first team preseason all Big Ten. Tyler Wall is one of my favorite players. This guy can do it all at six, seven, six, eight. He's tough, he's crafty. His offense is going, going to have to expand in order for them to maintain their level of greatness or consistency, I should say, with Wisconsin. And then also Stephen Crowell, seven footer, has put on a, an extra layer, Andrew, when I saw him at practice a few weeks ago. He's more confident. Um, Max Kles- Klesmit, I think that's how you – Max Klesmit is a transfer guard from Wofford. So he's a, he's a guard that uh, – he's a Wisconsin native, so he knows the Bash- Badgers system. But he's a guy that's gone, gone away from home, gotten some experience, comes back, and he really jumps off the page right now as a key contributor for the Badgers. Before I go on, I, I want to know, because you've mentioned uh, you're at Wisconsin's practice, uh, you've gone to Illinois' practice. When do you go to those practices as a, as a broadcaster? What do you look for in uh, what you're going there to watch for? I'm looking how guys respond to the coaches getting on their ass. Oh, excuse me, they're behind. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Yeah, um, you're good, you're good. I'm, I'm looking for um, guys' nonverbal communication. You know, uh, because when players play a a lot together, Andrew, as you know this, 
there's ways that guys move on the court where they can look at each other and they know exactly what each other is thinking, or they can make a, make a motion and the other guy responds almost naturally. So I look for nonverbal communication. I look for chemistry among players and I look for guys that can handle adversity. If the coach is getting on your back, do you pout or do you come back the next play and you give your best effort? Those are some of the intangibles that I look for when I go to practice. All right. And then at number 10, we have Maryland, who I, I'm not, I'm, I feel like this seems kind of a mystery. I don't know what they're going to be or who, who, what their identity is. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about Maryland? Well, Maryland got the only new head coach in the league this year, Kevin Willard. And Kevin comes from Seton Hall, and he had some tough, I mean tough, some of the toughest teams in the country the last three years were in Seton Hall under Kevin Willard. So I expect Maryland to be a very stingy, Defensive squad, uh, they've got some guys that they bring back in Dante Scott, um, who is a veteran in the Big Ten. He's an undersized 4-3, I would call him, a kid from Philadelphia, can score, can get downhill, can put it on the deck a little bit. Um, so he's a nice guy to build around. They also got this uh, uh, guard, transfer guard from Charlotte, Jameer Young. He dropped 19 a game last year. He's a D.C. Maryland native, so he's coming back home. Uh, they've got another uh, transfer guard from Georgetown. I think his name is Donald Carey. He's a DMV, a uh, uh, D.C. native. So they've got some guys who will take some pride in wearing that Maryland jersey. Uh, I don't. Uh, Julia, uh, Julian Reese up front is a, is a talented big, but he's going to have to have some help, and it's going to be interesting. There's a lot of unknowns with this Maryland Terrapins ball club, but I can tell you this thing. They're going to play hard on the defensive end, and they'll compete on the glass. And those two things give you a chance to win most games. All right. That, that's good to know for uh, Terrapins fans that uh, Maryland's are going to have a gritty squad that are going to, are going to like, hard hat, lunch pail. They're going to go and get it done. And then at 11, we have Micah Shrewsbury's Penn State team. And I feel like this is the Jalen Pickett show. Like, he's their, he's their main attraction. He's, he's their marquee, marquee guy. Like, we're riding with Jalen Pickett, and he's gonna. Be, we're hoping he's gonna take us to the tournament. Yeah, Jalen Pickett is is an interesting guy. I, he's kind of an old school YMCA kind of guy that you would smell like icy hot, and you know, got his <laughs> knees wrapped up and stuff because he's got that old man hurt jerky kind of game. But he's very <laughs> tough, very strong, and can score. Um, what is it? Uh, uh, they've got Miles Dredd, who's a three point specialist, and. What is the kid's name that is escaping me right now? Um, he's a wing player. Ah, Seth Lundy. That's it. Seth Lundy. So Jalen Pickett and Seth Lundy, if they're not 18 points per game plus, both of them, Penn State's going to struggle because they've got so many new players that they got to integrate. They lose John Hara, who was a big that really provided a great defensive stalwart and rebounding guy up front, they lose him. So they're going to have to rebound by committee. I don't know if they'll have a lot of size up front, but believe Michael Shrewsbury is one of the best young coaches in America. He'll figure out a way for Penn State to be competitive. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching Penn State as that's who Clemson has in uh, as they come to Little John Coliseum for the Big Ten ACC Challenge. We'll face them. So I'll get to see Jalen Pickett live, see how he goes against some of our guys. So I'm looking forward to that. And then 12, we have Minnesota, led by Ben Johnson, who I believe is in his second year, if I'm correct, as head coach. Yep. Yep. And last year, I feel like Minnesota got off to a really hot start and then kind of fizzled out. And, I mean, they have Jameson Battle, who's another, uh, I think, uh, preseason All-Big Ten second-team guy. So they, there, there is some upside there. I think they have Parker Fox still in Minnesota. So there, there is some upside in Minnesota. Well, I think uh, you're talking about Ben Johnson's team last season. They, they just ran out of steam because they didn't have a lot of depth, but they were competitive. They put themselves in position to win games, and they just came up short towards the end because the grueling um, nature of the Big Ten Conference just wears you down if you don't have a lot of depth. But this year, uh, you mentioned Jameson Battle, one of the best scorers in the league. He returns. But, buddy, Dawson Garcia, you hurt you, – Listen closely. Dawson Garcia could be one of the best players in Big Ten this season. He's a, he started his career at Marquette. He's a Minneapolis native, 
He transferred to North Carolina last year. He left midseason because of a health issue with his family. So this is a guy that's 6'10", lefty, uh, was can, thought of maybe after his freshman year at Marquette as a possible first-round pick. So this guy's on NBA radar. Um, he's going to be a matchup problem for a lot of teams, and he's going to bolster what the Gophers are trying to do. If the Gophers can get any – uh, production from their backcourt, any consistent production from their backcourt, they could be a pesky squad that could uh, pose problems for teams coming into Williams Arena. Oh, for sure. And Williams Arena is also one of the hardest places to play regardless. And, uh, and so away teams to have that going against them. And uh, just one thing I've like learned from watching the Big Ten the last 10 years is that teams just like to beat up on each other. And it's that's why probably – well, how many teams do you think will make the tournament this year at the Big Ten? I feel like it's normally like eight and nine range. I don't know about that many uh, because we, the Big Ten has had eight or eight and nine last year, eight the year before, and two years ago eight, and last year nine. I don't know that they'll get that many this year, just because of only five of the top twenty scores return in the Big Ten conference. Fifteen of the top scores are gone, so you're going to have a lot of guys playing new roles, and when that happens. To me, that points to some inconsistency, not uh, from not being capable, just, you know, guys having new roles in this type of conference. So I would be I, I would say more like six or seven, I would think would be a safe number of, of teams from the Big Ten to get into the tournament. All right. That's good to know. And in 13, we have Northwestern, who is led by Boo Booey, which is a player I really like, but. I think a thing on the mind is just in the basketball world I've heard is, is Chris Collins on the hot seat this year? Uh, you know, I, I would have to say, if I'm being honest, I'd have to say yes. Uh, it pains me to say that because Chris is a friend of mine. We go way back. I played for his dad with the Detroit Pistons when Doug Collins was head coach. Um, but they haven't gotten the job done, uh, point blank. And, um, you know, they're in a tough situation this year because they lose Ryan Young to Duke, who will more than likely Ryan Young is going to help Duke win some games early in the year um, until those freshmen get those diaper dandies get uh, seasoned enough to really hold it down. Um, but Ryan Young was a, a, a very good contributor on the interior for Northwestern. They lose him. They lose Pete Nance, who transfers to North Carolina. Pete Nance was, I believe, their leading scorer last year. It, he or Boo Booey. So he's gone. So uh, Northwest has got a, a UTEP transfer, a big, who's not a big scorer, but he's a good defender. So they'll count on him a lot. And along with Boo Booey, Rob, Robbie Barron, to me, could be an all Big Ten performer, but mentally, I think he he just doesn't have a lot of confidence, Andrew. But at 6'9", he's shown flashes that he could be one of the best players in the league. So if he can be consistent, if Boo Booey can be consistent, Chase Aldiz is a is a talented scorer that comes back as well. Um, but but the issue for Northwestern to me is ball control, taking care of the basketball, shot selection, and defensive prowess on the interior. All right, yeah. So Northwestern, it, it, it's an uncertainty there. And then the 14, last but not least, we have Nebraska, coached by former Bulls coach and former Iowa State Cyclone coach Fred Hoiberg. And Obviously, they're losing Bryce McGowan, who I believe was their number one scorer. He's in the he's on a two way contract with the Charlotte Hornets now, I believe. And uh, they're getting they are getting a Sierra Canyon guy who was teammates with Amari Bailey and Bronny Jr. and Ramel Lloyd Jr. So they there is some hope, but where do you see Nebraska being this year? Well, Nebraska's got to shore up their defensive end and, uh, and, and rebounding. They were last in both in the Big Ten last season. Uh, Derek Walker is an outstanding big at 6'8", 6'9". He comes back. He was very consistent last year. He just didn't have any help. But they've got a 6'11", junior college transfer, um, Blaze Keita, and he's one of the top JUCO uh, prospects in the country. So they're really looking at him to shore up defensively and help on the rebounding side. They've got transfer wings, Jawan Gary from Alabama, who dropped 20 points in their exhibition, exhibition victory. They also have um, Emmanuel Ban Bandabel Bandu Bandamel from SMU. So you look at Gary at six seven, 
Emmanuel Bandemel at 6'4". And the biggest, the, the, the guy that's probably going to have the biggest influence on what Nebraska does this season is um, Mike Greasel. Greasel is his name. He's a six foot seven point guard transfer from North Dakota State. He is big, he's physical, and he's sneaky athletic. So they're really high on him. And uh, Grissel is a Lincoln, Nebraska native. So he would like nothing more than to return Nebraska to a, a much better competitive level for the Huskers. All right. Yeah. So that wraps up for uh, the Big Ten preview. I do have a couple more. Uh... NCAA questions as a whole as there's there's some there's some ideas floating up about expanding the NCAA tournament which I'm personally not a big fan of because for like first off I think of the saying if it, if it ain't broke don't fix it and I feel like that explains the NCAA tournament perfectly because it's awesome right now and then we've already seen college like the this process already happened to college football, how it just lose the saturation. Like it's just getting oversaturated and stuff in the name of money. We're losing uh, all these historic rivalries with uh, the addition of conference realignment with Oklahoma, Texas going to the sec, all this big 12 news, just UCLA, USC going to the big 10. Just what are your thoughts on uh, the expansion of the March madness tournament? I'm not in favor of it, Andrew. I just think that, uh, as you mentioned, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the reason, the only reason people are trying to expand the tournament, the only people that are saying this are power five people. Jim Phillips, ACC commissioner, friend of mine, he's an Illini, but I totally disagree with him because, you know, they want to get more teams in the tournament. Or the SEC guy, uh, Greg Sankey, I believe the SEC commissioner, was upset because Texas A&M didn't get in last year. Win more freaking games. If you're a power five school or you're a power five AD or conference commissioner, win more games. It, so you got seven teams in, but you wanted eight or nine. Really? Like we really want to expand it. We want to expand the tournament. So we'll get the 10th place Pac-12 team against the ninth place ACC team. We really want to see that. Or do we want to see Oral Roberts? Uh, um, VCU, um, you know, the uh, uh, St. Peter's. UMBC. Just UMBC. I mean, that's what brings the tournament life. March Madness. They got their own alliteration, uh, alliteration with the name. They got the month. It's perfect. But if you expand to 96 teams, do you, can you imagine what's going to happen to the viewership of the tournament? You're going to lose people. You're going to lose. I'm telling you, you're going to lose it. It's going to be watered down. And to have 25% of the Division I basketball teams be eligible for the tournament, that's garbage. That doesn't make it, that, that doesn't make it anything. That makes it college bowl season, basically. M makes it more of a participation trophy. Exactly. Like, it, it's less of a big deal that you made the tournament and you get to hear Greg Gumbel say your name on that Sunday selection show and all the mid-major schools are going crazy because they won their tournament. They earned it like, like other, like Loyola Chicago in 2011, George Mason. Like we, you kind of lose all this, all these Cinderella stories when you do that Florida Gulf coast, just name another one off the top of the head. Yeah. I, I just hope that um, for once the NCAA and the power five uh, power brokers listen to, what people are saying instead of being greedy, because this is all about money. It's all a money grab. It's all about greed. And so I hope that that doesn't uh, win out the day because the NCAA tournament is perfect where it is. And if it, it expands to 96, it would, it, it would be tragic in my opinion, but we'll see what happens. And they, they already expanded the college football playoff to 12 teams in 2024. And like you listen to all these guys on ESPN, like Kirk Herbstreet, Desmond Howard, they're all like, is there is there even enough to get four quality teams? Because as we've seen in the last couple of years, the four one the four one game has been a blowout for the one seed. So now you're gonna put the one seed say versus the twelve seed, and you're just gonna get six more blowouts, and it just you ruin the quality of the bowl games. Because if you get the twelve seed versus the ten seed, you could have a really good game, and yeah. instead it's now a blowout, and it's part of the playoff. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Crazy, right? Yeah, I, I mean, just like I get, I get why like 
they're, it's doing all for the money, but I feel like just like, just like the wholesomeness of college sports is kind of getting tainted. Well, yeah, it's just getting exposed is what it is. It's, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's always been this way. It's just been covered up by rules or different things, but there was always cheating. There was always illegal payments. Now you can just do it legally with the NIL. Uh, but there's still all these things that are happening right now. It's just that the NCAA and college athletics are getting exposed for what they truly are. Yeah, so we're, we're, we'll talk about more on your personal life. So you, you were part of perhaps one of the greatest teams to ever be, not only in the Big Ten, one of the greatest, talent, most talented teams in history of college basketball is yourself. You played with four other NBA players and Kendall Gill, Nick Anderson, Kenny Battle, and uh, who, who am I missing? Uh, Marcus Liberty. Marcus Liberty, that's right, along with mm-hmm. even very other talent, the guys who didn't make the NBA, P.J. Bowman, Irvin Small, Lyle Hamilton. What was it like to be with that squad for a whole season and just, like, just honestly, like, just do you have any good stories? I was like, you're one of, like, the most interesting basketball teams. They called you the flying Illini because you were, like, some of the first colleges to d- dunk over everyone. And <laughs> you guys, I wasn't alive for it, but you – it sounds like you guys were one of the most fun teams to watch in the history of college basketball. We, we were Andrew and it was a lot of fun because the thing is, is that we liked each other. We really liked each other and we'd spend a lot of time off the court and on the court. We were just, that was one of the most competitive teams, if not the most competitive team I've been on. And that includes some NBA teams that I was on these guys, man, our practices were better than some games. Some of the best stuff that happened that year was in practice and the coaching staff. See, our coaches were really, they tried to be really uh, calm and until they got upset, but they, they didn't like to show us a lot of emotion, but some of the stuff they saw in practice, they couldn't help covering their mouth or, you know, like, Oh my gosh, you know, cause it was just a, a highly, highly competitive group. And, you know, once we got the number one ranking after we beat Georgia tech on super bowl Sunday, we end up losing the next game at Minnesota. But once we hit number one in the country, we seem to get rock star status. And so Kendall, Nick Anderson, and Kenny Battle had to get aliases at the hotels that we would go to on the road because agents and their runners were trying to get to them. And ladies were trying to get to them. <laughs> and so they, they had to have aliases on the road. So we were kind of had rock star status uh, going around the Big Ten this, once we got in the tournament. And then we got to the final four. It just built up, but it was a magical season. We came up short of our goal to win the national championship, but it was a wonderful season. And it's helped me in my professional career uh, in broadcasting as well. Yeah. You guys are like the, the champagne Beatles uh, with uh, the, <laughs> his, his, the hysteria and all the, all the publicity there. And you guys probably uh, just like ran that town uh, the, those couple of years you're at Illinois. Oh, it was fun. I mean, we, we could, we could go in certain places and get, you know, I don't know about free stuff, but we get discounted stuff every now and then, but no, it was a love affair between the, the Illini nation and our team. And, and one, because of the uniqueness of the, the style of play, Dick Vitale named us the flying line. But two, everybody, but PJ Bowman was originally from the state of Illinois. And that made it, we had pride putting those jerseys on. So it was, it was really special. I, I do I do have an interesting question. Which team do you think was better? Your team or the what was it the 04 or the 0405 Darren Williams, Luther Head, D Brown, James Augustine, Roger Powell team? Which team do you think was more talented? Or can you not compare eras like that, do you think? Oh yeah, I could I can certainly compare eras. And it's ironic. I I ran into James Augustine yesterday. So we had we had <laughs> caught up a little bit, but we would smoke the 2005 team. They, they, they wouldn't be able to keep up with us. Um, they were super talented. And it, let me make this distinction. They're the most successful team in Illinois basketball history because they got to the national championship game. We didn't reach the championship game. We got beat in the final four. So they are the Heart, most successful. Heartbreaking fashion. Yes, heartbreaking fashion. But if we, go, if we look at the roster, Darren Williams is a beast. I would have tried to guard him, but I, I don't know if I could have slowed him down or not. So I give the edge to 2005, Darren Williams over me. 
Everybody else is cancel Christmas because D Brown, although D Brown, everybody loved him. He, he couldn't do nothing with Kendall Gill. Luther Head was outstanding first round draft pick. He couldn't do nothing with Nick Anderson. Nick Anderson was the toughest wing player in the country that year. Um, small forward, Roger Powell was outstanding. He couldn't, he couldn't, he could not deal with Kenny Battle. Kenny Battle was one of the best players in college basketball that season. And then James Augustine and Lowell Hamilton, they they probably would um they probably would cancel each other out. So if you look at the center position, they about equal. Point guard position, the 2005 team uh, has the edge. But the other three positions are flying a line, I no doubt. And our bench was much better than their bench. So that's why I think the um, flying a line, I would have beaten the 2005 team. I mean, yeah, and Kendall Gill and Nick Anderson are perhaps two of the three, four greatest NBA players that Illinois has produced. That's true. That's true. So, no, we – we had a whip, man, and I, they did as well. But I think that, you know, matchup wise and just, uh, you know, sh- a sheer will, they, they were a great team, gr- great competitive team. I don't think they would have beaten us, though. And then uh, you mentioned uh, that team, or we talked about that team. You actually mentioned how you started in the media business. You actually called the famous Illinois uh, comeback victory over Arizona. How did you start uh, getting into the broadcasting business? And when did you know that's what you, what you wanted to do when your playing career came to an end? Well, Andrew, I studied broadcast journalism at Illinois. So I knew about my senior year in high school that that's what I wanted to go into. So that's what I studied. And then when I was playing professionally, I got 10 years of professional basketball in, a lot of it overseas. Uh, but in the off season, I would come back and internship. And so I would intern. I interned with CBS2 Chicago under Jim Barry. He also had a radio show on WVON that he let me host once or twice. Uh, then I worked with CLTV, a Chicago Land Television here in the Chicago Land area. Did a lot of, I did maybe three or four years of interning um, there, covering the Bulls during during some of their magical runs. So um, I remember it was the last year of my professional career. I came back home during Christmas, I was at the United Center and Illinois was playing somebody. It was, uh, I can't remember who they were playing, but they were playing someone and the athletic director then, Ron Gunther at Illinois, he was at the game and he said, listen, would you be interested in doing the radio? And I was hesitant at first, but Ryan Baker, who was my college roommate, who is now the uh, morning news anchor for CBS2 Chicago, he said, no, Ron, he's taking that. Yeah, he, he, yes, he's taking that job. And I was like, well, what's the, what's the money? And Ryan's like, it doesn't matter. You're taking the job. So I finished my career uh, playing in Japan. We won a championship. I came back home, and I started the University of Illinois men's basketball job. And that was the best thing uh, that I could have done, Andrew, because on radio as a color analyst, you've got to be very succinct, very quick in your analysis because – the play-by-play guy on radio has to talk 75% of the time. So you only get about 25% of the time to jump in. And that's where I hone my skills. And I was very fortunate to have some people open up some doors moving forward after that. So you st- did you start, was Brian Barnhart still the play-by-play guy when you started? Uh, so Jim Turpin, Jim Turpin was the guy that I started with. And then Brian Barnhart was there my last maybe year or two, I believe, that working there. Because I did the... I did the radio five seasons, and I believe that um, that last year or two, I worked with Brian Barnhart. So then, did that catapult your jump to ESPN to start calling basketball? The Illinois- yeah, it did um, because I went from I did men's uh, radio for Illinois, then I was doing um, Conference USA regional ESPN regional games. Then um, I got my big break with uh, – I was in a three-man booth in the first and second round of the NCAA tournament for CBS. I was with Tim Brando and Mike Jeminski. And I did a great job on those games because the coordinating producer at ESPN, Dan Steer, who now runs NBC Sports, Dan Steer was a coordinating producer at ESPN. He saw my games I called during the tournament, and he immediately signed me to a two- or three-year deal with ESPN national and that's kind of how my career took off uh from there 
And then I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you actually uh, co-host like probably one of the most famous sports shows uh, on television <laughs> right now. You are a, a fill-in host for ESPN First Take for a, for a couple times. And how was it working with arguably like the most <laughs> infamous man in sports media, Stephen A. Smith? Well, it's, it's ironic now, Andrew. Here's the thing. I took Stephen A's place. So they were, I don't know if people remember, Stephen A left ESPN for about a year. And I was kind of filling in. So I was button heads with Skip Bayless. Oh, so, and, so an, a, another infamous he, uh, yeah. talking head in the sports media world. No, it was great because I, I, did, I did the show. I probably did 12 to 13 uh, first take shows and, and had great chemistry with Skip because we would battle on the, on the air. And I would come from left field and say some things that people didn't expect me to say. And the people at ESPN really loved it. So it was a great opportunity. And I, I, I appreciated that because it gave me great exposure. Like, you know, college basketball on ESPN, a lot of people know you. But when you're on first take, every sports fan in the country knows who you are. And it really helped bolster uh, my exposure at that level. Yeah, because we're talking national, uh, at the time, national sports media shows. Number one was probably Mike and Mike in the morning right before. And that went right in the first take on uh, mm -hmm. ESPN. So it was like, it was a good, I mean, I wasn't alive to see it. I would have loved to uh, watch you and Skip go go at it. Uh, I, I would have enjoyed that. And but now you're obviously at Fox Sports and Big Ten Network. And or how or how is it different compared to ESPN? Uh, now you're just calling pretty much Big Ten and Big East games. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot different because my ESPN schedule was grueling. Um, I I called West Coast Conference games, Big Twelve games. Every now and then, Big Ten, and then I would do a, have a studio night. So my weeks would consist of I would be somewhere. I'd call a game like Saturday afternoon, either a Big Ten game or like a uh, an Atlantic Ten game. I'd come home Saturday night, throw all my stuff in the in the uh, washing machine. Hopefully, try to get to my dry cleaners. Sunday, I fly out west. Say I'd fly to Gonzaga. I do a, a, a Monday night game in Gonzaga, fly to Big 12 country, do a game Wednesday night, um, be, you know, get off the air, get up 4.30 in the morning, 5 in the morning, fly to Bristol, Connecticut, which was a long trip. You're flying most of the day. You get there. You're in studio from 7 to about 1.30 in the morning. That's Thursday night. Then you leave early Friday, you fly somewhere for preparation on a Saturday game. And it was like that. It was, it was, a, it was tough. It was nonstop. So that's what they, that's what Dan Steer did when you first got to ESPN. He would put you on a very tough schedule to see if you could handle it and see how you did. And I did well. I was able to kind of move, not, not doing West Coast Conference all the time, but I started to do more Big 12 some Big Ten, and I started to do a little bit more Big East games or ACC games as well. So uh, it was a tough thing, and so it was more national. With Big Ten Network and Fox Sports, I like it more because it's more regional, and you can, you can get a lot deeper on your analysis and your knowledge and the relationships that, you, that I make with Big Ten and Big East coaches is really, really rich and deep, and they give me a lot, of, uh, of, a lot more information because I'm just not fly by night. I'm not coming in to do a game. Then I'm off to another conference. I can really lock in on these two conferences and really give in depth um, analysis. And so I, I, I kind of like this setup a, a little bit better than I did at ESPN. Plus big 10 network and Fox sports are way less political. ESPN is a political minefield and you got to be very careful how you navigate that situation when you have opportunities there. Yeah, and then fun fact, uh, I don't have the picture pulled up right now on my phone, but I'll put it in on the on the podcast for the viewers out there. But we actually met in person one time when I was in, like, the fifth grade at a DePaul game. You were calling a Big East game for uh, DePaul versus someone. Like, it was, like, Southeast Missouri State. There was, okay. like, nobody in – there was, like, nobody in the arena. I was with um, uh, two, two of my friends uh, in fifth grade and one of their dads, and after the game – like my dad or his dad knew my dad went to Illinois and was a huge Illini fan was like, that's Steven Bardo or uh, calling the game. Let's go take a photo with him after the game and send your dad. So I think I might've sent it to you before, but um, 
it's just, yeah, uh, it's me and uh, these two other guys. And uh, it was just you after getting done with the call. So that was a fun fact uh, about uh, us, I guess. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I need to see that again. You need to yeah, remind I'll, me I'll, of that. I'll, I'll send it over. I'll text it over to you after the show. Okay, cool. Sounds good. And, the, and then to wrap up this episode, let's do a, an all-time Big Ten starting five. I'll let you go first on who you want to take at point guard. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Magic Johnson. All right, that, that, that was the slam dunk. Like, that, you, you have to take Magic I, Johnson. Then. No, I could have taken Isaiah Thomas now. Don't forget about Isaiah Thomas. Now, he, he won a national championship as well. I mean, Isaiah's definitely the number two guy, but I don't know if I can, as a Illini fan growing up, if I can take him. <laughs> at point, I don't know if I can take Isaiah, even though he's I him you. and Magic are by far the number. Like, I mean, Darren Williams. I have to. I feel like I have to get an Illini in there, but I'm. I, I have to take Isaiah Thomas. He, he was just that good at Indiana. Got got the got a ring there. Darren Darren fell one game short, but uh, Darren will definitely be honorable mention there for sure. Okay, him that sounds Trey, good. Trey Trey Burke, another honorable mention. It was a great point guard of Michigan. Uh, D'Angelo Russell. I mean, a lot of my guys are gonna be way more recent than yours, just because. Sure. I haven't been. I haven't been around way longer than you, but Isaiah definitely for a point guard. Who do you want to take at shooting guard? This is a tough one because I was gonna go way, way back, and think Mike Woodson because he was definitely one of the best two guards to ever play in the league. Um, but I think. Wow, this is tough. I might go. Uh, uh, who you got, Andrew? Who's your two guard? I think I'm. Um, this guy was a two-time Big Ten Player of the Year. I'm not sure if he was totally a shooting guard, but uh, he was listed as a shooting guard uh, on the Wikipedia list I was looking at. But mm -hmm. it was Jim Jackson for Ohio State. Ooh, that's a good call. <laughs> I I I wasn't gonna put Jimmy in there, but Jim. Jimmy is – that's a good call. Um, I would either go Jimmy or possibly Steve Alford. Steve Alford, another great pick uh, for Indiana yeah. there. Yeah. I, you know what? I could go with Jimmy Jackson. Though. That's a good pick. It's a good pick. Yeah, so Jimmy Jackson. And obviously, I know in the line I shooting guard, I mean, D. Brown was technically that position. Uh, another Big Ten player of the year. Uh, another Big Ten player of the year I forgot to mention for the line I was uh, Frank Williams, DeMonte's dad. Yep. was a good, a good baller back in the day. So yep. I like those two. And then small forward, I feel like I know who you would take because uh, – or maybe not, but I know you said this was one of the toughest guys you had to go, or that you had to play against in college. Glenn Rice, hands down, best small forward in Big Ten history. Yeah, and then another one, I'll take this guy, but Steve Smith from Michigan State, who is there at the same time, another, another really tough player. So you would put him at forward because I thought Steve was a, a point guard. Steve Smith? Yeah. I, I, can, State. I, can, I can put him anywhere. I was just I was just looking at uh, I was looking at this list earlier and they had uh, Steve Smith listed as a forward. No, he's he was a point guard. They listed him as a forward because he was six eight. But Steve was a point guard at Michigan State. So but no, that's 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 good. Okay, who you got at four? All right, four. I feel like I gotta go with Chris Weber at Michigan, one of the, one of the Fab Five, and I think he's a good player. Could could go more recently with a guy like Draymond Green, but I, I like mm. Chris Weber. Getting uh, uh, is he is he in the Hall of Fame for uh, NBA? I think he's close, but I don't know. If I he think got he it. is close. I, I think he's been nominated once or twice, but I think he's close. I would I give a slight edge to Jerry Lucas from Ohio State. You know, another, I mean, he another. he was one of the statistical juggernauts of the league, uh, rebounding, scoring, led Ohio State, I believe, to a fi two Final Fours, I believe. So I'd go with Jerry Lucas at, at, at the four. That's a good pick. Another NBA Hall of Famer, top five player in Big Ten history, perhaps. Mm -hmm. yep. And then to round it out center, I got to take a guy from uh, my neck of the woods over in the western suburbs of Chicago. He's a uh, – Wisconsin guy, another Big Ten player of the year, but that's Frank the Tank Kaminsky. Mm. He's a graduate of Bennett Academy, which is about 20 minutes from my house. So I got to go with Frank the Tank here. 
Frank is a great, that's a great choice. And, and if you talk about a guy that came into school and made a progression, like really tapped out on his potential, I think, I think you're right with uh, Frank the Tank Kaminsky. I was leaning more towards Greg Oden. Another because, great pick. First overall you know, pick in the NBA, NBA draft. Yeah. I was leaning more towards him for his college prowess. Now, obviously, he got to the pros and was, had an injury play career, but in college, he was dominant. So I would probably go with Greg Oden. And then some some other guys I had on my list that I could have put on there was uh, Glenn Robinson for Purdue at, at the forward position. Could've oh, my gosh. Wait a minute. We left Big Dog out? Yeah, we left. Oh, my uh, God. We, we didn't mention any of the flying Illini guys. I obviously put Nick Anderson up there, Kendall Gill, Kenny Battle, any of those guys. Uh, I mean, Luca Garza could make a run for it at center if you want. If you need an offensive weapon there. Yeah, I, you know what? I would probably put I would put Glenn Rice and Big Dog in there in mind. You could for e- either forward position. So those would be my two forwards. I, I forgot all about Big Dog. He was oh my goodness, he's the best scorer the Big Ten's ever seen. I think. So but yeah, but no, those I are great. That's... Those are great names. Yeah, uh, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this episode. Uh, first off, uh, Bardo, I gotta, I gotta, I really appreciate you coming on and spending your time here on the show and giving us some of your college basketball wisdom. Uh, where can people find you on social media? You can go to Bardo's Breakdown. Just Google it, and you'll find it on uh, Facebook. You can also go to Bardo Media on YouTube. Really trying to grow the media, the uh, YouTube channel. So those are two places you can find. It. Also, just start dabbling in on TikTok. Also at Bardo Media on TikTok. Yep. That's and then right. Instagram and then Instagram and Twitter. I think it's just at Stephen Bardo, right? Correct. That's correct. So definitely want to go give this guy a follow because I, I did a list of the, my top five favorite NCAA or the top five best NCAA college basketball broadcasters, and you were number one on my list. So my man, I appreciate that. <laughs> definitely. If, if you, if you're interested in college basketball, want to know the ins and outs of everything going on, the ones and twos, as you would say, Bardo of everything going on in the, in the big 10, big East, even college basketball world, definitely follow along on his social medias and check uh, Bardo out. But once again, appreciate you coming on to the show. And uh, I, I had a great, I had a blast uh, this past hour talking uh, hoops with you. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Andrew. I really appreciate it, my man. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, uh, that will be all. Uh, go check out Bardo and check out uh, Zoomer Sports and other platforms. Thank you guys for listening.